Hi. Welcome to Artist and Critic. I'm Don Gray. We're continuing with our uh, discussion of, I guess, what w we would call the sickness of our time, the emphasis on the mind and on material things uh, to the exclusion of spiritual and emotional, to the exclusion of the wholeness of the human experience. Last time we uh, read an article concerning the these uh, specific symptoms as represented in the corporate executive, how the higher they get, the more uh, refined they become, the more uh, narrowed and restricted they become in terms of bec literally becoming uh, mere functionaries within their company, uh, losing their human qualities, their, their emotional qualities, their spiritual qualities, having to sacrifice their idealistic qualities, their values, their principles. And we spoke of how this can be found in, is the predominant problem in modern art. That all of us, uh, one way or another, are affected by this problem, whether we think that we're secure in suburbia, whether we think that we're secure in our wealth, whether we think that we're secure in our good job. Uh, we're all shaped and to a degree dehumanized, narrowed, our human potentials are limited. Um, we could perhaps look at one example of an artwork uh, by George Siegel, the gas station attendant, and while this has more feeling in it than most of the geometric abstraction, and the cold, impersonal handling of art of our time, which I'm using as a prime example of art of this kind, any geometric sculpture, painting. It seems to me that the very fact that Siegel is using plaster, that he leaves the figure, that he's going for a certain reality by wrapping a living model in cheesecloth drenched in wet plaster, letting it dry on the figure, removing it, and then putting the pieces together to make a figure, that he's striving for a certain realism. But at the same time, uh, what we're left with is an image of dehumanization, of death, of literally bloodlessness, as, as the human feeling and warmth has been drained from the figure. And we have simply the husk that modern life uh, too often creates. He sits alone, isolated, uh, heavily depressed, uh, between the ubiquitous corporate symbols of Coca-Cola. Uh, you know, this is the real thing, and baby, this is really the real thing. This is the real thing behind the real thing slogan of Coke. Loneliness, isolation, just uh, tedious, almost tedious boredom of, of a life without great meaning. Uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, in his address to the graduating class at Harvard in 1978, spoke about uh, these problems. And I'll try to uh, hit some excerpts, and then we'll talk about some specific things in our own time that are reflected by this. And, and as kind of a disclaimer, we might say, yeah, well, he's a communist, and he's speaking up for socialism. And that's hardly the point. He was imprisoned in Siberia by the, by the communists. And he says, if I were today addressing an audience in my country, Russia, in my examination of the overall pattern of the world's rifts, I would have concentrated on the calamities of the East. But since my forced exile in the West has now lasted four years, and since my audience is a Western one, I think it may be of greater interest to concentrate on certain aspects of the contemporary West, such as I see them. A decline in courage may be the most striking feature that an outside observer notices in the West today. And of course, McCoby, in the article on the corporate executive, was speaking of just exactly that same thing. The Western world has lost its civic courage, both as a whole and separately, in each country, in each government, in each political party, and of course in the United Nations. Such a decline of courage is particularly noticeable among the ruling and intellectual elites. Of course, the political elites, we would talk about the art world elite. Uh, they think they're very adventurous and avant-garde, but really they're very uh, timid and backward, clinging to uh, inhuman geometric art, abstraction, or very uh, uh, coldly impersonal uh, works like photorealism, this kind of thing. It's, it's, it's 
Unfortunately, it's very widespread. This uh, noticeable decline of courage among the ruling and intellectual elites causes an impression of a loss of courage by the entire society. Uh, this is a point we out in the hustings and the boondocks and the provinces and the cities and the towns may not be as bad off as our leaders are, so, as those that receive publicity. And we'll be Solzhenitsyn talks about fashionable thought a little bit later on, how uh, only a few people have access to the media to speak and most of those are in declined in courage and humanity, and we just see their sickness uh, expressed on the airways. There may remain many courageous individuals, but they have no determining influence on public life. Western society has chosen for itself the organization best suited to its purpose and one I might call legalistic. And he uses this in a very negative way, that we abide by the letter of the law, but we use the law to manipulate uh, values and principles. The limits of human rights and rightness are determined by a system of laws. Such limits are very broad. People in the West have acquired considerable skill in using, interpreting, and manipulating law. The laws tend to be too complicated for an average person to understand without the help of an expert. Every conflict is solved according to the letter of the law, and this is considered to be the ultimate solution. If one is right from a legal point of view, forget moral, spiritual, nothing more is required. Nobody may mention that one could still not be entirely right and urge self-restraint or a renunciation of these rights, call for sacrifice and selfless risk. This would simply sound absurd. An oil company is legally blameless when it buys up an invention of a new type of energy in order to prevent its use. I mean, this, of course, is extremely common. A food product manufacturer is legally blameless when he poisons his produce to make it last longer. And after all, we're free not to purchase it if we don't want to. So, uh, the Ford Motor Company, when pintos were blowing up and burning people, uh, they let that go on for months before they were forced to do anything about it. So, uh, because they were making a profit. Solzhenitsyn says, I have spent all my life under a communist regime, and I will tell you that a society without any objective legal scale is a terrible one indeed. But a society with no other scale but the legal one is also less than worthy of man. Hastiness and superficiality. Now, let's think about these in relation to art and to our human relations and the function of life. Hastiness and superficiality these are the psychic diseases of the 20th century. And more than anywhere else, this is manifested in the press. And he goes into an attack on the, the press, which will uh, bypass for a degree here. But most, one of the major problems of art is its artificiality, its superficiality, its hastiness, its lack of profundity, its impersonality, its meaninglessness, essentially, except as a symptom of the dangerous situation we're in. Then he talks about fashionable thinking. Without, and we apply this to art and life. Without any censorship in the West, fashionable trends of thought, excuse me, and ideas are fastidiously separated from those that are not fashionable. And the latter, the unfashionable ideas, without ever being for, forbidden, have little chance of finding their way into periodicals or books or being heard in colleges. Your scholars are free in the legal sense, but they are hemmed in by the idols of the prevailing fad. Of course, the prevailing fad in art is abstraction, uh, dehumanization, impersonality, geometry, aesthetic dabbling, uh, photorealistic uh, imagery that is, has simply no soul, is soulless, is, is a shell and is the exact symbol of the superficial relation to life we have today. There is no open violence as in the East, as in Russia. You step out of line and you're in Siberia in 10 minutes. However, a selection dictated by fashion and the need to accommodate mass standards frequently prevents the most independent-minded persons from contributing to public life and gives rise to the dangerous herd instincts that block successful development. In America, I have received letters from highly intelligent persons, maybe a teacher in a faraway small college who could do more 
much for the renewal and salvation of his country, but the contrary country, I'm sorry, cannot hear him because the media will not provide him with a forum. You know, where can the media continually tell us that we need to be informed. Radio stations, all news programs sell us that, you know, we have to be informed citizens. We have to read the papers. We have to watch uh, news programs. But we're really fed a very narrow selected spectrum of news that helps support our way of life. And I'm not talking against our way of life, but it's a very materialistic, narrowly uh, corporate concern. People talk, you know, you, you hear about one rape, one murder in a subway, and you've heard them all. They're all human tragedies, but they blur the essential profundities of life. We become uh, traumatized by them. We don't want to hear anymore, so we become further isolated in that way. Solzhenitsyn talks about a dangerous uh, turn since the Renaissance from spiritual, spirituality toward materialism. And he's not saying that the uh, Renaissance was bad in itself. He will say that the medieval period, a time of great spirituality, repressed the flesh and repressed material things. I mean, we're, we're material creatures, but we're also spiritual creatures. And the Renaissance, uh, in many respects, and its offshoots to the present day, has emphasized the materialistic the exploration of the world. I mean, it's not all wrong. I'm not saying that either. But, but uh, you know, the uh, search for uh, resources and materials and minerals. And uh, we've turned outward away from the inner life, just as we turned away from the outer life toward the inner in the Middle Ages. And what he's calling for is a balance, an understanding that we're both flesh and spirit, that we're both inner life, feeling, and spiritual things as well as body, uh, material things, sensual needs, material needs, economic needs, that kind of thing. So with that in mind, Solzhenitsyn says, I am not examining the case of a disaster brought on by a world war and the changes which it would produce in society. But as long as we wake up every morning under a peaceful sun, we must lead an everyday life. Yet there is a disaster which is already very much with us. I am referring to the calamity of an autonomous, irreligious, humanistic consciousness. This is the consciousness that has sprung up since the Renaissance in the 15, 14, 1500s. It has made man the measure of all things on earth. Imperfect man who is never free of pride. Uh, that's one of our great, our great sins. We're, we're so smug, we're so self-satisfied. Uh, I, I sometimes watch people walking on the street and you can sense uh, depth of soul or lack of soul in them and I sometimes think of the phrase arrogance of health. Uh, we're healthy, we feel invulnerable, we're never forced to probe to the deeper depths of our being, the deeper levels of, of life, we're to, uh, content to ride the crest and uh, it's not that we don't want to be healthy but you see someone who's been sick physically or mentally or spiritually, and you see something in the eyes. You see a depth, you see a haunted quality perhaps, someone who realizes that they're not the center of the world navel, that they're in one sense helpless in the hands of God, of destiny. It's, I was watching a program on Robert Oppenheimer the other day on educational television, and you could watch this change in the man from a, a very uh, intellectually brilliant man, uh, somewhat cocky, somewhat self-assured, uh, a very creative man. I'm not saying he wasn't a man of depth and substance, but then you watch him as he loses his place of power in the government, his security clearance is taken away from him, and you begin to realize then the haunted look creeps into his eyes as he grows older, uh, alone outside of the structure of society, and you realize how much this very independent creative man who read uh, Sanskrit and the Bhagavad Gita, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, uh, very profound religious ideas, was very dependent on outer things for his own personal support instead of inner things. And you feel that he came closer to the truth in the despair of older age than he was in the full bloom of his youth. And this is what I mean, the arrogance of pride, the sense of we, we're invulnerable. 
So this autonomous, irreligious, humanistic consciousness that Solzhenitsyn talks about has made man the measure of all things. Imperfect man who is never free of pride, self-interest, envy, vanity, and dozens of other defects. And we look to these people in cults today to lead us, you know, in Est and Synanon and, and uh, the Moonies and so forth. Imperfect, vain man, Moon sits up with a crown on his head. Uh, it's a symptom of the time, see, and we'll, we'll talk more about that in a minute. On the way from the Renaissance to our days, we have enriched our experience, but we have lost the concept of a supreme, complete entity which used to restrain our passions and our irresponsibility. We have placed too much hope in politics and social reforms. They help, but they're not enough. Only to find out that we were being deprived of our most precious possession, our spiritual life. It is trampled by the party mob in the East, the Communist Party, by the commercial one in the West. Our corporate mob, the narrowly intellectual, dehumanized types that we've discussed. This is the essence of the crisis, the split in the world between East and West, capitalism and communist, is less terrifying than the similarity of the disease afflicting its main sections. The split of emotional spirituality, emotion and spirituality from the coldness of the intellect. The intellect unworn by the emotions is a terrible, terrible thing. It leads to dictatorship, totalitarian, murder, brutal manipulation of people, Nazism. Uh. If, as claimed by humanism, man were born only to be happy, he would not be born to die. Since his body is doomed to death, his task on earth evidently must be more spiritual. Not a total engrossment in everyday life, the corporate will to power, not the search for the best ways to obtain material goods, and then their carefree consumption. It has to be the fulfillment of a permanent, earnest duty so that one's life journey may become, above all, an experience of moral growth. To leave life a better human being than one started it. It is imperative to reappraise the scale of the usual human values. The usual human values, another car, a better home, a better job, more money. Its present incorrectness is astounding. It is not possible that the assessment of the president's performance should be reduced to the question of how much money one makes or to the availability of gasoline. So, uh, there are more important things. Yes, we need gasoline and we need money but we don't need that much and we need other things just as much or more. If we are spared destruction by war, life will have to change in order not to perish on its own. We cannot avoid reassessing the fundamental definitions of human life and human society. Is it true that man is above everything? I don't see how. Is there no superior spirit above him? There has to be. Is it right that man's life and society's activities should be ruled by material expansion above all? How can it be? We see the results all around us of living life like that, and we're heading toward an end of some sort. Is it permissible to promote such expansion to the detriment of our integral spiritual life? If the world has not approached its end, it has reached a major watershed in history, equal in importance to the turn from the Middle Ages to the Renaissance. It will demand from us a spiritual blaze. We shall have to rise to a new height of vision, to a new level of life, where our physical nature will not be accursed as it is in the Middle, as in the middle Ages, but even more importantly, our spiritual being will not be trampled on as it is in the modern era. So he's calling for a blend of these things. This ascension is similar to climbing onto the next anthropological stage. No one on earth has any other way left but upward. And that's the last word of his address. How do we try to get upward? Since 1947, you, unidentified flying objects have been seen in the skies. Uh, they may be real or they may not be real. Uh, Carl Jung, the psychologist, saw them as 
uh, symptoms of psychic integration, of the desire for integration, the fact that they were round, uh, saucer-shaped, uh, the shape of a mandala, a circle, which is a symbol of psychic integration. They also suggest that the word life on Earth is extremely difficult, as Solzhenitsyn has been saying, and that we have been looking to help extraterrestrial help. Uh, God, in many respects, has died in our time, uh, and that's why we're s so unspiritual, so unemotional, that's why we're so intellectual. We've come to depend upon ourselves, man, the manipulator of technologies that will save us. So that as a substitute for Christ or God, we look for extraterrestrial spacemen. Say. And, and in movies and plays, they're always more intelligent than we are, say, in many respects. Say. They're, they're coming, in many respects, to bring knowledge and awareness to us. Uh, but we're also somewhat threatened by uh, new things, and, and sometimes they bring threat. I must admit, I'm not big on space movies. I, I haven't ever seen one, but one absorbs things through the atmosphere of the times. The current uh, Star Wars uh, is a projection of earthly violence out into the universe. It's a projection of our urge to our urge to kill, if we want to put it that way. This violence that stems from frustration in earthly life. Uh, movies like uh, E.T., Extraterrestrial, uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, are this yearning for something beyond life that, that will, will save us. Uh, the rise of the moral majority is, of course, a counterflow to this very, uh, this overly materialistic emphasis. Now, that's all well and good to help us to become more spiritually aware, but uh, one has the feeling of, of a right-wing conservative fundamentalist uh, dictatorship possibly emerging out of this. That's the danger of it. See. We'll overcompensate for our over-intellectuality, our over-rationalization. We'll, we'll become um, almost voodoo-oriented in a way, see, instead of being balanced. Censorship and book banning is another reaction to the, is, is an offshoot of this moral majority attitude, uh, is a desire to escape the chaos of the time, the meaninglessness of the time. It's a symptom of unease and a lack of confidence. That if we control our environment like a vice, you know, we put everybody's mind in a vice, their bodies in a vice, and we don't allow them sexuality, or the expression of ideas, somehow we in our insecurity will be more secure. The, the, the moral breakdown of our time that Solzhenitsyn and, and others uh, talk about. Uh, doctors performing unnecessary surgery so, uh, to make more money, this emphasis on materialism. The legalisms, the legal society that Solzhenitsyn talks about that is legally right but morally uh, bankrupt and corrupt. We think of all the lawyers involved in, in Watergate, for example. The, uh, um, we, we have more lawyers than we would ever need uh, if our population was doubled or trebled. The rise of alcoholism. Why are so many people drinking? Life is so difficult. So, and, and they haven't found themselves, they haven't integrated themselves, and they try to escape uh, the desolation of life in the illusion of alcohol. The same thing with drugs. We talked a little bit last time about the worship of sports stars and celebrities. We feel somehow that they've escaped the, the deadening uh, mass life uh, that we think we all live. And, and so we fix on them. We fix upon the birth of the prince, uh, the new prince in uh, England, the marriage of Diane and Charles. As th there are symptoms of almost a rebirth of our own uh, hopes, so, sort of a, uh, our own royal marriage, uh, if you will, our own uh, personal fulfillment. It's common knowledge that a lot of people think soap operas are real. And if some favorite star gets killed or, or something happens, they, they think that's really happening. And of course, some of that is simply naivete or, or ignorance. And also, it's a confusion of fantasy re with reality. It's, it's, it's thinking that other people's lives are so much more exciting and meaningful than ours. So, and 
Uh, I don't think other people's are so much more meaningful, but I think ours are rather drab in many respects. Because uh, of all the things that I've spoken about and I've read, and that we have lost a sense of purpose in our life. We feel politically that our, our votes are meaningless. Say, what, what can I do? This kind of thing. Uh, in this atmosphere, we're, we're in great danger from group orientation, whether it's religious cults, self-improvement cults, political groups. Uh, they're liable to be some uprisings of very mass movements that will be as disastrous or more disastrous than the rise of communism, of the Nazis. Uh, we're heading towards some profound change, as Solzhenitsyn says, arising at another anthropological level. Uh, the, we may have a third world war. That may have to be what happens when all this frustration, all the rage is released and society simply uh, purges itself in horror. I mean, this is why wars happen. That's a result of them. There may be other political, uh, socio-economical, economic causes as well. So. Maybe, maybe a war won't happen. But I sometimes wonder why all this talk suddenly of uh, banning nuclear weapons. Why all the sudden fear of a nuclear war? Who's instigating it? Is it real groundswell fear rising from the people? I mean, it's a legitimate fear. I'm not saying that. Is it being orchestrated by the government? It seems like since the Reagan administration came in, we're more worried about uh, nuclear warfare. We've always been worried about nuclear plants, uh, many people. Certainly Three Mile Island brought that to our consciousness. But uh, is there going to be a nuclear war? So, uh, it, if there is, it may be inevitable despite the demonstrations. That's the tragedy of it. So, and uh, there may be an upstream swing of, of consciousness that is is uh, almost premonitory in a sense, a premonition. You know, I sometimes wonder about the uh, electronic games that w we're fascinated by. You know, one of them advertises our most dramatic effect, the disintegration, the destruction of a planet. Say, we have George Plimpton on the uh, air advertised trying to sell that. Well. Uh, what can be so satisfying about the destruction of a planet unless it's the planet Earth that is so uncongenial to our lives? We, we get an unconscious satisfaction. We get rid of the world. I'm, you know, you'll hear people say, if I pushed a button and could blow up the world, I'd push it. See? This is a sign of ultimate frustration and dissatisfaction. So there, there are a lot of other things that we could uh, talk about. The fascination of Rubik's Cube, for example. You know, trying to, people trying to solve the uh, chaos of the time, the riddle of existence with a, a cube, a rectangle, the most stable of, of all forms. That, incidentally, has been the most prevalent form in modern painting, the rectangle and the cube. But uh, maybe we'll continue this in another uh, program. But it's clear to me that we're in difficult times. I don't feel that we have to give in to them. I think we have to a fight, at least stand up for our own lives, and in doing so, we, we help the world. We have to try to be as full, fully rounded as human beings as we can, as expressive as possible. In art, we have to try to create art that is uh, living, alive, and uh, decries the inhumanity of our time in art and life. Program is Artist and Critic. I'm Don Gray. We'll see you again uh, next time. Bye-bye.